And welcome back to episode 22 of Friday Night Counter Attack. So we've got another special guest on and we've got our, our brilliant co-host as usual. So we've got Salem Parkinson, as we like to call him. And Saf, we're gonna have to find Saf, we're gonna have to find you another name for your amazing interviewing skills because today we've got a uh, referee, referee and legend, and English football referee and legend voted one of the top 100 referees of all time, Mr. Keith Hackett with us today. So Mr. Hackett, thank you very much for joining our podcast. How are you doing today? I'm fine. Delighted to be on your show and uh, hopefully giving your listeners some insights into refereeing, perhaps. Yes. Some, give them some food for thought, if you like, going forward. Because as, as we've had a referee on previously, who's refereed at the, gra the grassroots level, it was just the next step forward to really get someone who's actually been there and done that in uh, so many different uh, stadiums, so many different locations around the world. And Prior to our, our podcast recording just now, you just told us about how you travelled from uh, continent to continent, just literally just uh, being a referee. So I can't wait to hear your stories and I can't wait to learn firsthand how your experiences were over the years. So if you'd like to just start us off on how you became a referee, that would be yeah. a great little start for us to listen to. Well, I, I played uh, for a local junior team uh, around, I was 15, 16 years old. Yep. And uh, the... The county FA decided that they would have, uh, out of each team that was playing at that time, one person had to be volunteer to go forward and learn the laws of the game. And I, and I was that guy. I was the captain of the team. Uh, I went for six evenings uh, over six weeks and uh, sat and learned an awful lot about the laws of the game uh, and um, then sat an examination and... Uh, I passed that examination, and I had no intentions of refereeing. I was still wanting to play. And then one particular weekend, we did not have a game, and I got a call from the county FA, and it, and it was a quick call. It was, ah, oh, Mr. Hackett, uh, you're refereeing Hillsborough Boys Club versus Sheffield United Juniors Saturday at intake school. Mm. And before I could answer, the phone was put down, and, I, and I'm going, well, I had no intention to refer. So I borrowed a referee shirt and shorts from a friend of my father's. Um, I then went out and bought a cheap whistle. Uh, and uh, I had a wristwatch, not a stopwatch. And um, I bought a new pair of boots because uh, every referee has a shiny pair of boots. Anyhow, the outcome was I went to intake school uh, on the outskirts of Sheffield. I had no car, so it was public transport. I arrived probably two hours before kickoff. Uh, no one there. And then eventually people came. I refereed the match. I was complimented afterwards. And, um, and then the county FA rang and said, look, you've done really well. Uh, will, will you take more games? And I totally enjoyed it. And the, the reason being is that as referees, we're involved for the full 90 minutes. We're absolutely involved before and after, after the game. Yep. I'm thinking just a minute, as a, as a player of the quality that I was, uh, my mind would drift. And if there was, a, you know, I'm in a park and there's another game alongside, I'd finish up spectating that during the course of the match. And probably, you know, if you consider that there's 90 minutes and 22 players, you know, players don't often have possession of the ball two or three minutes at most. So that's how I got into it. And it, it was something that I, I started enjoying. Um, and it was a, I was earning some money. In, in all English money, I was earning about, I suppose, in, in modern day terms, something like 50 pence a game. Oh, wow. So, uh, and, and refereeing, you know, on, on one, one weekend, probably... You know, under 14s, under 15s, and then on a Sunday refereeing, uh, pub two pub teams, and and uh, throughout my career, even though I got to the very highest level, you know, people talk to me now and say, I can remember when you refereed West Germany versus Italy in the European Championships opening game. I watched you on television. I watched this game. And then he said, I ran out in Concord Park on a Saturday afternoon, 26 pitches, and I was absolutely gobsmacked that you were the referee. 
And I said to my mate, this must be his twin brother. And he said, and you might not remember, but I asked you, are you Keith Ackie, the referee? And you answered yes. And he said, so I was somewhat amazed by that. But I wasn't because uh, if you're passionate about the game, any game to referee is something that you, you want to do. Definitely. And I used to do, I think, it, you know, I used to do about 100 games a season. Wow. Is that normal for this kind of day and age as well, for referees to do that? I think that uh, certainly I coached Howard Webb and Howard Webb was a police officer before he became a professional referee. But even when he was a Premier League referee and also on the international panel, occasionally Howard would come back and referee grassroots football. It's not the norm anymore. Really? They you just know, stick no, to the Premier League yeah. and they just stay there? Yeah, basically. yeah. And, and to some degree, I understand that because of the uh, intensity of the number of games to get, you know, in, in my era, era, it was, you know, you might get three games a month yep. and then a couple of midweeks. So, so you might finish up with four games a month. You know, some of these guys already, somebody like Atkinson and, and Oliver, 23, I mean, Oliver's had about 24 Premier League games season today in the middle. He's had uh, four Champions League games. He's had two Nation League games in the Europa. And in, in addition to that, he's had um, VAR and fourth official. So you can see how uh, intensive it can be, particularly when you've got to train pretty hard and you, you've got to have recovery sessions. So it, it is different. But I still think that if you're in love with the game, and these two teams, and you're, you know, walking past, and there's no referee. I used to carry my kit in the in the boot of my car. I'd be the first to volunteer. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's how passionate we are about the game. Because we've had a referee on previously about how he's had to travel um, far across the country as well, just as a referee and as a volunteer as well, before he got paid, which is brilliant to hear as well. But with the situation when you were growing up as a referee, were many people kind of asking you to referee the game, was there a, a demand for referees to come into the game or was it more along the lines of, I'm really good at this now, I've been told that I'm good at this, I want to continue to referee and build my skill, not just for the love of the game, but for, for more myself as well. Is that how it went for you in a way? Yeah, I think I think people have to understand that it's, it's you become very competitive. Yes. And, and uh, the biggest competition you face is yourself. Um, because, you know, you have a game and it goes well, you, you, there's no expectation that the next game will go equally as well, because it doesn't. Is it very so, easy, or is, sorry to interrupt, is it very easy or is it very hard to kind of learn from the mistakes you make in a game for the next game that comes across? I'm not sure how many mistakes you made, but when you look at well, the I, referees of this day and age, do, do you see that happening yeah. now? You can see them making uh, amendments, really, to their own game. Well, I should do more. I think I think it's a really important question that you asked uh, because um, referees do learn by their mistakes. But um, one of the things that can reduce that that number of error, if you like, those number of mistakes is you become a member of the referees association. Yeah. And so once a month you meet with other referees. I can remember going to my first meeting in Sheffield. And sat across the table was George McCabe, an international referee. Next to me was a football league linesman. And so you listen to what they had to say. And, uh, and, and people would ask questions. And it was a great learning curve. How to avoid problems. How to deal with problems. You know, because you start off understanding that there's 17 laws in football and you learn them. You, you're pretty knowledgeable when you pass the exam. So there's a massive difference between knowing the game, the, the laws of the game, and putting them into practice. And you know, at grassroots level, um, in my in my era, you'd get probably one supporter, a couple of supporters. Now what you've got is youngsters coming in, 15, 16, uh, my age when I started, and suddenly they're running out in a kid's game. And a, you know, two thirds of the of the perimeter of the pitch is filled with parents who are screaming all sorts of things. Their expectation that is every every referee that goes out in there should 
children's game is Alina or Webb or Plattenberg, that, that sort of scenario. And of course, sometimes they fail to understand that that man in the middle is like the young players. Learning to play, he's learning, or she is learning to referee. Yep. So you try to avoid errors, but the one thing you do is, first of all, it's an interesting question because you've got to get to a point where you, when you review the game post-match, you admit that you've made an error. But sometimes you don't, you know, you've got that much confidence and adrenaline flowing. Everything you do, you believe is right, what you're doing. Because that's literally, that's everyone's just following your lead on the pitch as well, because um, Salim plays Sunday league football. He did when the lockdown wasn't available. So he's discussed with yeah. us previously that sometimes a ref sometimes will admit or won't admit their mistakes. But Salim, I was just wondering, have you seen anything in terms of referees from your side, from being a player on Sunday League, that they've kind of done what Keith's done or what Umar's done, who was also a referee that came on the show, that they've played the game of football and they've also gone into refereeing because they can understand the game better. Have you seen a bit more of like referees that kind of under, uh, understand the game a bit better from your side? Yeah, I mean, I'd probably say like the referees that tend to be more sort of um, open in its, in terms of communication kind of thing. I, I'd say like we sort of prefer them in, instead of the ones I just sort of like sort of like dictators on the pitch saying oh this is a decision is done like that's it move on but some of them are a bit more open saying look this is what happened and this is why I've given it so we sort of prefer yeah. that um there was one game actually that um sort of springs to mind it was a sort of Sunday league game so you can just imagine some of the sort of dodgy tackles that happen uh but yeah there was a game that was happening and um sort of start of the game first like sort of two three minutes or something and um so I went past the player and uh, he came and like speared me over and um, I think it kind of like uh, stamped on me as he walked past. But um, so obviously like I'm like on the floor, or whatever, trying to call the ref over and uh, and the ref's feedback for that was always, it was too early to send him off or too early to book him or something. I can't, can't ruin the game or something like that. And I was yeah. like, well, well, that's not acceptable. Like, no, but yeah, that, that's one thing that sort of springs to mind is like disappointing. Like, I don't think that there should be like a time scale as to when like, you know, all right, it probably would ruin the contest because it's 11 versus 10, but you can't be doing stuff like that on the pitch and getting away with it. No, absolutely not. I mean, uh, you know, the, the important aspect of a referee is he's got 90 minutes and 90 minutes plus. Um, and, uh, you know, what you've got to do in those situations is, is sometimes make that courageous decision. And that is, that is a red card. Uh, and, but then what you should do is ask yourself, would you have avoided it? Is there a way in leading up to that, even though it's early in the game, is there a quiet word that you could have done? I mean, what uh, tends to happen often is that a referee, a referee um, builds his own reputation. And this might be in your case, Alan, where uh, suddenly you're coming across, you've had, a, you've had a referee and you've respected him, he's respected you, and you think, hey, he's had a good game, that guy, he's gone out of your mind and then a few weeks later uh, or months later suddenly that same referee appears and you think oh it's a fair ref this I think we're going to have another good game and and therefore that referee is slowly building his reputation and you know um, it's important for referees to be consistent and to learn from the mistakes I, I can once remember you know we in Sheffield there's a place called Concord Park and when I started refereeing, there's 26 pitches. So it's busy. It used to be busy. It's changed now, but it used to be really busy. And you might get two games you know, on a Sunday on, on that particular pitch. So time, timing's important, 11 o'clock kickoff, and sometimes you go 10.30. And I, I, I was there for, if you like, the second shift. I was there for an afternoon game or early afternoon game. But I decided to go as a spectator and watch another referee. And I was watching this referee who was probably in his 50-odd age group, uh, not as mobile uh, as you would expect for a referee of that age. And you suddenly think, well, just a minute, he's behind play, but he was smiling. The players were accepting generally that he was making the decisions. They were enjoying the game. He was keeping the game flowing. But there was a centre off who kept putting his hand up and screaming offside every time the ball went anywhere near his defence. 
side and occasionally he'd say, come on, referee, get up with play. What are you doing here? Are you refereeing this match or another one on another field? And so the referee blew his whistle and went up to him, and the centre-half was quite a big guy. And, uh, and uh, the referee got hold of the ball, and he said, right. And, he, and the, the pitch was at the side of a hill that goes on to the golf course. So it's quite a steep slope. And the referee faces this slope and he says to this number five, right, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to kick this ball as far as I possibly can, as far as I possibly can. And what I want you to do, number five, is catch it. Are you okay with that? Number five says, that's impossible. And he said, well, have you noticed this game of football is a little bit like table tennis? Have you noticed how old I am? I'm trying to keep up with play, but every time I come near you, you boot the ball in the opposite direction. I haven't got a jet engine on my back. So just accept the odd error from me. And I always remember, I'm thinking, he's not going to get away with that. Then. But, but then for the next 15 minutes, the whole sort of level of the game changed. And it was still intensive. They were still playing a good game, but it won the respect of the players because the players <laughs> saw the amusing bit about it. And so communication is, is massive. And, of course, um, when you're refereeing a game, I mean, I, in, at Wembley Stadium in front of 100,000 or Real Madrid, Bernabeu or, or Azteca Stadium in Mexico with a... 120,000. Uh, those, those are just some of your achievements, aren't they, Heath? The fact you've actually actually been there and done that. You're not just saying it. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm talking, I'm talking about experiences here because I'm bringing a subject in that's, that's equally important about the communication element. So because just to confirm, you, you did the 86 World Cup. You've done Wembley Stadium. You've done uh, the European Cup as well. And you did the FA Cup final. It was Oxford and QPR, I believe you've done as well. Oh, that was the FA. That was the football league. My my football FA league. Cup final. And remember, you only get it once, really. Uh, I did uh, 1981, the 100th FA Cup final, which was between That's... Tottenham and uh, Manchester City. Yeah, I mean, I, I was lucky enough. You know, all all the major tournaments, uh, trophies, and in England, I was appointed to because I was on. I was a professional. I was an amateur. Remember that I was never a full time. Referee, you know, up to 1999, we had amateur referees refereeing in the professional game. So I would have a job as a sales and marketing director, yep. probably the country, but then I would have to get some time off work to go and do a football match. But the point I'm making is that communication is vital. And um, what is even more important is that when you're in a big crowd environment, People can't hear what you're saying, and therefore body language, the quality of signals is so important in refereeing. The ability to be able to say, you know, I mean, I say to young referees, look, never say, never say to a player, come here, I want you here. You know, what you should do is use a triangle. Think about a triangle, players at point A, you're at B, and you say to the player, come and join me at C. And what you're doing is you're reducing conflict. Mm. You know, and then rather than saying the next time you do that, you're going to get a yellow card, uh, that's a threat that you've got to carry out <laughs> next time. So you're much better off saying, look, I, re I require an improvement from you. I want an improvement in your behavior. And it leaves all options open. So that's one. It, it's an important aspect of, uh, of the communication aspect as well as the whistle. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I was in... Uh, Cameroon a few years ago and Ethiopia and Botswana and all those countries and running workshops and we would put uh, the, the, the people from villages are standing around the center circle we'd give them new whistles and then we'd have to teach them how to blow it because there is a technique there's a technique not just to get in the sound but you want to make certain that if that's a bad tackle you're going to hit the whistle really hard but those are the, the technical aspects of, of refereeing that you either pick up listening to other referees or watching other referees. 
and you don't try and pick up their, their bad habits. Because for... I was just going to put, sorry, oh, wait, I was just going to put something in there then. So in terms of when you were refing in Sheffield, were you the linesman as well as sort of the main official as well? Yes, yeah, so that's the same yeah. as we've got, that's the same as we've yeah. got here as well, like the yeah. referee does that as well. But the problem is we've got a few referees who are, obviously no disrespect, but I don't think their fitness is as good as the other referees. Oh, so what they absolutely. do is, well, so yeah, so mean, they've got this technique, they've got this clever technique that they just stand basically in the centre circle and they don't leave that centre circle. But the problem with that is it, they, they don't really like follow the game kind of thing. So it's hard for them to see the offside and, you know, yeah, that I, kind I of think thing. I, 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 if you if you read my posts, if you I'm jumping quite a, a, a bit of time really to give you a, a background really because um, when uh, when I was a referee grassroots level and then semi professional level the Northern Premier League with Macclesfield and Wigan and all those because they weren't in the football league then um, what I had to do is I used to get up at seven in the morning. Uh, sometimes earlier, go to a local football field and run round it a dozen times in a given time. And I used to do that most mornings. And then in the evening, probably do a few sprints if I was at home early enough. Um, and I would eat. I mean, I, I'd, I'd eat anything. There was no restriction. When I, when I became the boss of the PGMOL, the Professional Game Match Officials Limited, having put forward a proposal when I retired from football, we need to move towards full-time professional referees. Um, I brought in a sports science guy. I brought in product manufactured in a software program, invented, if you like, in Leeds by a company called Prozo. Yeah, Prozo. <laughs> Analyze all of the information a little bit like the FIFA game. Yeah, you know, yeah. animation and all of those with it, but very accurate. And so we started measuring referees, and we and I brought in sports science, and we started measuring. So we know a Premier League referee runs about eleven and or should run about eleven and a half thousand meters per per game average. Um, we at the time when we first started, they were doing ten. We knew that uh, the distance from ball needed to be about 20 meters max. We knew that a high speed sprint was seven meters per second. Now I know those all sound technical, but the process of a referee is to see, first, recognize, think, and act. And this is no different to you driving a car. You go out and drive a car, you, you You've got the vision. Is somebody going to step off the pavement? You know, you recognise that somebody's going to step off the pavement. Your thinking time is very short. You're applying the brakes. Um, and so that's what we do naturally. And in refereeing terms, the big, I, you know, I've examined hundreds of games at the professional level and also at grassroots level. And, and the shortfall in refereeing is they don't see. And they don't see because they're not fit enough. And so the whole aspect of training for the professional referee changed <laughs> from endurance to uh, high intensity sprinting. And I brought in a sprint coach. Um, and so that was one part of it. And then nutrition. Because, you know, if you spoke to one referee, he'd go, yeah, I, you know, the night before I like to go to the chippy and have a big meal and a few uh, mushy peas to get them, and, and all that goes with it, or whatever they had. Uh, and then, you know, we suddenly are commissioned uh, up a university to have uh, a program where we created a, a, a booklet on nutrition, <laughs> understanding the food intake, the engine, and all that goes with it, all technical aspects. And one of the areas that I'm critical of now is, you know, um, I looked at uh, John Moss over the weekend. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I, you know, what I did when I was boss of the PGMOL, I used to have in the boat of my car about half a dozen bags of sugar, two kilograms of sugar bags, right? And if I saw somebody that was a bit, bit weighty, I'd say, right, here you are. 
here's a couple of bags of sugar, run with those. And they used to look at me going out. And I go, what? I said, well, that's what you carry. So we had regular body mass readings. Mm. And then th that referee would get advice because, you know, you've got to be athletic. So, and, you know, if we look at FIFA, the international body responsible for referee, not the most <laughs> game, re the referees, if you're on the FIFA international panel, you retire at 45. Um, if I told you in the championship, SG2 is a professional referee, not SG1, SG2. We have a 56-year-old referee. Oh. And if we take the current 19 select group referees, five of them are 50 and over. Mike Dean is 52. And so when you start to look at sports science, you know that there is a measurement called VO2 max. And, and, and that works against you, age related. It's, it's, the, you, it's taking in the oxygen and putting it around the body and it gives you a measurement. And the older you get, you can't fight it. You know, it slows down. Just nature, you know, really. You can make up those things with experience. You know, you you, be, you become a better game reader, but you know, I was I was uh, just coming up to fifty when the you know the Premier League had been formed two years before. I was ready to retire at forty eight. I was I'd been it, done it, seen it, and I uh, and I was asked to to stay on uh, for a further two years. And when I when I was touching fifty, I knew that this was a game for young guys. And so within, within the context of refereeing, and again, I just want you to understand this, and that is, there's about 27,000 registered referees in England. I suspect with COVID, it's less. Not because of deaths, I think there's, you know, there's some that have said, right, I'm not going back to it. So let's say it's 25,000 registered referees, only 19 of those get to the select group, get to the professional level. So back to the question you asked earlier, it is a very competitive environment. And therefore, you're not only competing against yourself, but the pressure should be that every game you referee, whether it's in the local park, a local school, or at Wembley Stadium, it's a cup final. <coughs> you know, you're getting paid. You're getting paid a few quid. I said, I don't know, some referees now earn 20 pounds. I mean. Hey, when I refereed the cup final at Wembley and I did the replay, I know times have changed. Um, the guy came in from the FA and said, right, Mr. Hackett, you've got a choice. 25 pounds, uh, 35 pounds match fee for the gold medal. I mean, it's a no-brainer. I was taking the gold medal. Mm. But, but now you can get that sort of money. And... and you know, if I'm a university student and I need a, a bit of pocket money, it's not a bad way of earning a few bob in order to, to, to do a sport that you might love and participate. But I think that what, where the FA fall down is they don't, they don't grab enough players. People are playing the game and say to them, look, have you thought about becoming a referee? You know, because, okay, you're enjoying playing with your colleagues, but there's an opportunity to to get to the very top and you know one of the one of the major things in in refereeing in this country and i spoke about it and i've spoken about it over many years was that i was the boss when uh, uriah ready became a premier league referee and uh and as a as a black referee he was pretty outstanding and and i thought that he set the pathway that we would get a reasonable mix of, of people from various backgrounds into refereeing, but it's fallen off. It didn't act as a catalyst to get more. And so I said a few years ago to the FA, you've got to create specialist programs. You've got to go out into the, into the cities and, and actually say, look, get a recruitment drive, get people to understand that this is not as lonely a job as you think. Yeah, because this is this is when I wanted to bring in Safian as well, because 
Safia is someone who's very passionate about getting a lot more diversity out there in terms of football, uh, not yeah. just in the football players, but in the staff, in the scouts, in the coaches, and in the referees as well. And we've discussed this previously with us as well. So Safia, I just wanted to know, what do you reckon uh, with what Mr. Hackis just said, what do you reckon could be done in terms of getting more diversity into uh, football referees, football linesmen? Do you reckon there's anything that could be done with what um, Mr. Hackett's just said? Yeah, I mean, um, yes, yeah, so, you know, you know, Mr. Hackett's come come across with some very, very valid points. Um, but what my what I'm confused about is that okay, we've we've established that refereeing is not as easy as everyone thinks it out, uh, you know, thinks it is. But at the same time, where is the benchmark set as you know, um, in terms of, in terms of what the person requires to become one. Now, I understand it's not just um, players who can become coaches. Oh, sorry, referees. Um, it's not just people involved in football that can become referees. But at the same time, I, I do strongly believe that even you know, there there must be referees at lower lower levels. Um, you know, Sunday leagues that are from a different background, you know, um, from an ethnic minority. Um, and and they, must be, they must be trying as well, but there must be, isn't there a way or a system which is bringing, can bring these kind of referees forward um, to maybe, even if, it, even if they can't hit the top, top levels, but be able to, showcase their um you know their their quality in terms of on the pitch whilst refereeing i mean we know the pressures of um, refereeing is not is not something that everyone can cope with but there must be some sort of um so idea. like an it's like an academy then in a way so you, the like you know how you get like trials and stuff you're saying something in terms of like a uh, referee academy yeah. where you get to go like a couple of times in the year they can see your skills they can see you develop that type of thing if you can exactly. cope with the pressure up. Was that something you're trying to look at? Yeah. Well, I, I think that um, what I think is important is, is uh, a coaching mentoring program. You know, and uh, I think that every referee, every referee should have a, uh, should have a mentor. Yeah. That mentor is a more experienced referee. It, it doesn't have to be a professional referee. It can be someone that's operating at a higher level, that's been through the path. If you like, it's a forest. And he's at the other end of the forest, and this guy's only at this end of the forest and can show him the pathway. So I think it is um, feasible for the FA to, to fund those, uh, if you like, relationships that help to guide that individual, um, how to deal with conflict on the football field, um, how to overcome, if you like, some resistance, because... Um, but also to understand that, you know, I mean, I helped uh, and got involved with, uh, with a referee here in, in Sheffield. Um, and I had to almost put a, a break on his, on his view because he, he thought that, just a minute, I've been at, I've been at this now for three years. Why, why am I not on the Football League? And I had to say, look, I, I love your enthusiasm. But I'm trying to give you smart objectives, the specific, measurable, you know, achievable, yeah, yeah. related over time. And, and uh, without getting too complex, but say, look, I'm not suppressing your uh, development. I'm actually giving you a realistic view. I was 12 years refereeing at grassroots football, and I was one of the youngest referees to referee the FA Cup final. Michael Oliver was eight years, nine years at grassroots level before he got into the professional environment. So it is a long apprenticeship, but I think that uh, it doesn't matter your background. Um, the reality is that sometimes in a modern age, there's a frustration because there is an expectation that I've now refereed this game, I've done another one and I've done another one. So why am, why am I not at the professional level? And it's that mentoring that puts some realism into the development and career path of a referee that's important. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you clarified that as well, because it's just like we were just saying with uh, Safian and Salem before that. It's not, it's not, um, it's not the lack of knowing really. It's just the fact that they're it's they're just unaware of their their career path. Like we were saying before, there's no uh, quick route to success, but there's also an actual route to uh, to progress as well. And even people listening to this or people understanding this, they'll know it's not going to be an easy fix of refereeing a year or two in in grassroots and football league just before they get to the Premier League or whatever it is. There is a hard route to get there and it's a successful route because it helps build your discipline. It helps get you ready for hostile environments, which is, again, something you probably would get at Sunday League football, I'd imagine, if you do get yeah. pushy parents. Yeah. And I've seen that as well from my scouting days of yeah, yeah. literally yeah. just uh, the kids always getting berated by the parents and the parents berate the kids and stuff like that. But it's yeah. just one of those things that you can't replicate it when you're inside a, an 80,000 stadium at, at Wembley football at Wembley as well. No, but what, you, what, what you can do, I mean, in those situations, and I think this is why, you know, the, the Referees Association when I was there was, was much more buoyant than it is today. Uh, but you can learn by asking questions. And I think it is a, it is a lack of understanding. It's a, it, it's a knowledge base that says, where do I get from this level, whatever the number is, to the to the top level, and understand the career path of a referee? First of all, you know, when 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 you're refereeing, you know, kids football, the, the secretary of the club gives you a mark out of ten, and uh, and sometimes secretaries of clubs who are giving those marks uh, don't realise how important they are. But then I say to referees you haven't got to worry about the mark you receive. What you're doing is you want to give a 10 performance and hope that somebody's going to give you a 10 and it will not happen. The, the realism is, you know, you've got to make some tough calls during the course of the match and you might be pleasing one side, you're upsetting another. <laughs> the, the, the thing is that in a way, uh, I, always, I always thought, the pressure on me as an individual referee was more in a local park when there were about half a dozen spectators than in than in you know Anfield or Old Trafford. Was that because, because you could hear them a lot clearer as well? They were a lot closer absolutely. to you. Absolutely, you can hear every comment, and I think this is why it's you know when I, I I probably went four or five years of refereeing without spectators, any spectators. So I'm given a smooth entry path. So you can get a lad or a girl who's passed the fitness test, passed the test, right? And tomorrow she referees or he referees and um, he's in front of 100 spectators. And they're 16, 17 years old and they've never been criticised in their life. Yeah. You know, and all of a sudden they've got, they've got screaming parents and some of them threatening. And so it, it is a tough introduction. And I say to any, anybody, if you've refereed for a couple of months and you're still refereeing, you've made it. You absolutely have made it. And from there on, you know, when you're watching a game of football, if, if you're a Leeds United supporter, Manchester United, whoever you're supporting, right, if you want to be a referee, watch the referee. What, what little strength can you pick up from that individual? You know, can you gain guidance? And sometimes, um, you know, in England, we we come in with a we can come in with an agenda. That is, we've seen the game, we've been a supporter, we think we know the game, but sometimes we don't. Yeah. And then it's it's when you're suddenly faced with, Frankie, what happens next? And you go. Uh, you know, I can't refer to the laws of the game book. I haven't got it with me. I've got to make a decision. And that's when you've really got to learn to make the decisions and stand by what you've given. And, you know, sometimes avoid the conflict. I, I think sometimes younger modern referees, they almost stand there, look at me, I've given this decision. I, I'm really clever, aren't I? Yeah, so I, but, sorry, there's one know, that I wanted to point out as well. Sarah, you may have remembered this. It was when there was, it was in League One or League Two, there's that referee that was standing up to that Ipswich player as well. So he, yeah. he wasn't having it. And there's that picture of him like talking down to the player because he wasn't taking any of the 
um, the abuse that he was getting from the Ipswich player as well. So that was something that I thought was quite refreshing personally, just from a neutral yeah. point of view, because you're just yeah, there watching yeah. referees getting attacked left, right and centre from the media, from the players, all yeah. about VAR, like we know and from managers that we've seen with Mourinho and Stratz Ferguson in the past years, obviously with Phil Dowd. But um, it was just refreshing to see that they're kind of standing up for themselves and, and in a way showing that we are human beings. We do deal with the pressure just like you. And we've got our own pressures to yeah. deal with as well. Yeah. Well, I think that, I mean, first of all, one of the important aspects of a referee is, is to remain calm. Yeah. Because, um, you know, you, immediately you become slightly aggressive, which you did that referee, Darren Drysdale. Um, the danger is you, you, you could be seen by his team. Just a minute, he's got something against us. He's not being fair and equitable around two teams. So that these are all the different pictures and scenarios that you can you can go. Conflict management is really important. This is this is, you know, um, how how do you deal with conflict? And uh, it takes two to make an argument. And therefore, it also means that sometimes you can go into the zone of that player and threaten him just by being there. So I th I think that there are, there are if you like, methods and techniques that you can employ that, 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 that can quieten down the conflict. You know, okay, let's look at the management process of a player. Uh, if I felt a player was getting slightly hot under the collar and putting it about a bit and having a go at me and everybody else, uh, you know, he's had a bad Saturday night, he's probably had too much to drink, uh, and he's, he's now wants to take it out of everybody, and he's a loose cannon in that sense. Then as a referee, I'm going to run alongside him. I'm going to have a quiet word. I'm going to say, hey, I'm here to enjoy the match. And most of the other players are trying to enjoy it, and you have been a bit disruptive. Just You're coming into my sideline too often. Just can you, can you improve a bit? Then he doesn't respond to that. The next thing then is now a public review. So come here, captain. Come and join me. Let's have a conversation. This player is getting in my face, and uh, I'm now telling you, I really do need an improvement. And the next time is the next time. Have you got the message? Um, and then the next time it might be a yellow or red card. You've gone through all those sort of uh, skill sets that you develop as a referee uh, in terms of conflict. And, and I think that often, Young referees are taught the laws of the game, one to 17, and you know, you do this, that, and t'other, and they're not actually taught about dealing with, with players. And, and players, you know, sometimes you can get aggressive players just by their very nature. If, if you know, if, he, if you're referee in Italy, the, the, you know, in that part of Europe, um, they're used to talking with their hands. They're expressive people. They are, yeah, times. and and sometimes the expression is like, uh, you know, as suddenly <laughs> that comes out, and less of that, and more of that, and it looks worse. Mm. And, and you know, that's why the laws say dissent by word or action. But um, you've got to you've got to balance that. You know, I when when the wall was existing, I would be travelling to Eastern Bloc countries, and I can remember. Um, going to East Germany to referee East Germany against uh, Switzerland in a in a World Cup preliminary game. What year was this? Sorry, this was in the early eighties. Eighties. So, what kind of players were playing for Germany, East Germany, and Switzerland at that time? Can you remember? No, I can't. Uh, I mean, Germany. There were there were people like Muller and and, and various others. I, I can't Good remember Muller. that many yeah. players have come across. But 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 here was. Uh, yeah, well, it, that was East Germany, not not West. It's in the two. But in, but say I went for ten yards in England, you have to pace out the ten yards. You have to say come here, and it was a long drawn out procedure. In uh, in Romania, in in East Germany, I, I put the ball on the spot, and all of a sudden the players are ten yards back. Decide an authority. Yeah. And that's how the country's run. 
and, and players are disciplined to that extent, extent. And so understanding the countries in which they come from, you know, um, I mean, I can remember refereeing Gdansk versus Juventus uh, when, you know, the trouble at the ship guard gates and, and all that goes. And I met Lech Valencia, the leader of the, uh, of the, of the uprising, before oh. the game. And I said to him, are you going to the game? And he, I knew it was a football fan. Hmm. And, he, and he goes, maybe. You know, and, and he, he was low-key trying to keep out of the way. But during the course of the match, the ball went over the fence. Because they had high fences. And, uh, and all of a sudden, the spectators split. The ball was left there, right? And they're all singing solidarity, solidarity, right? And, and I stood there waiting for the ball. And I'm saying, you've stopped the watch. Don't rush. You know, allow, allow some exhaust of that frustration. Um, you can't control it. And I think, in a, in a way, that it's an expression of players, you know. There's, there's different players, different temperaments, different nationalities, different styles of, of referee uh, in terms of different styles of playing. And you have to meet. You have to read the game, read the environment, and and determine how you're going to cope. You know, and that's uh, something I wanted to just ask you now. I wanted to change the kind of theme of what we're going for as well, because um, us at Friday Night Counter Attack, we wanted to kind of know a couple of quick fire questions we had for you as well. Yeah. So, like with one of them at the moment, um, well, first of all, for me personally, I just wanted to know because you've managed uh, you've managed to referee over the course of two, three decades in in the game. I personally wanted to know. Because of the teams that you mentioned, the players that you've mentioned before, could you name kind of the top five players that you could that you could remember actually refereeing on the pitch from your career yeah. from um, the 60s to the 90s? Uh, because it, 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 it's quite a long list. Uh, I, could, I, I can't imagine you could get five in there with the but, uh, but I mean, competitions you've I mean, uh, Maradona. Wow, is he uh, number one? How is he? How is he to manage? Well, I, I don't think he's necessarily number one. I mean, what <laughs> my my number one? My number one was uh, Kenny Dalgleish, Liverpool. And, and would, the, reason, the reason being was, one, he was aggressive. He wasn't an easy player to referee. He was challenging. 100%. When he crossed the, the white line, he, he, his vision was, I'm going to win. Yeah. And I, I, I intend to win. And I want to win through skill, not through fouling. So... So Dal Gleish figures very highly, and I'm not one to five in terms of where they're positioned. Um, Carlos Alberto, Brazil. Wow. The defender. i tell you a story. Uh, I refereed in 81 as a guest referee on the North American Soccer League. When they, when they were Vancouver Whitecaps, uh, you know, the late Peter Lorimer, I... Uh, I refereed when he played for the Whitecaps, um, you know, Tampa Bay Rowdies and the like. And I, I was going to Giant Stadium to referee New York Cosmos against Vancouver Whitecaps. And I'm, 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 I'm in a chauffeur-driven car and uh, we're, we're blocked in Lincoln Tunnel. There'd been an accident. So we weren't moving. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And you suddenly think, you know that the game's on television, all the pressures... Am I going to be able to prepare and all that goes with it? And uh, and all of a sudden, the driver jumped out of the car and started screaming uh, in in a, a language either Portuguese or, or Spanish, I don't know. But he was screaming, and uh, and you know I was sat in the car and I'm thinking, is is there a fire or something? <laughs> what you know? Uh, and then all of a sudden, um, the door opened. Passenger side, I'm this side, and uh, Carlos Alberto stepped in. Wow. Carlos Alberto, knowing that he was uh, decided to go for a run in Lincoln Tunnel to make certain he did. And so we sat there, uh, we didn't exchange much views, but there was Carlos Alberto. Uh, Michel Platini was a, 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 a French international who. Uh, yeah. Had a sweet pass of the ball, a great vision, and all that goes with it. Uh, he was a, a player that I enjoyed refereeing. Uh, 
you know, you, you've got, uh, so, so he, he was big, Dalgleish. I think, um, I, I struggle, I don't struggle because in, a, in, in the decades that I've gone, I've seen loads of players, you know. Um, Did you manage to see Johan Cruyff or manage, uh, um, was he I someone? Really, I, in, interestingly, not as a player, but as a as the guy, I, I, I was invited to go to Thailand, Bangkok, to referee in a three-way tournament. Yeah. Um, Ajax, Nigeria, and a team from uh, yeah, team from Brazil, four-way tournament, and the Thai national team. What combination, and, uh, right there? And uh, Ajax arrived en masse. Um, first team, second team, juniors, and and uh, it's interesting because I, the coach recognised me and I, I chatted. Um, and I said to him, I'm really surprised that you've brought the young lads to Bangkok. <clears throat> and he goes, this is a learning curve for them. It isn't always about football, Mr. Hackett. Is We will be looking at these players. How do they behave when their parents aren't with them? Yeah. Uh, you know, they're in an environment of entertainment, but are they going to be focused on training? We will... We will, in the next few days, get to know more about these junior players and to whether we, are, we will retain them as players on our books. Um, but then you see the, the, the whole club had, had style, you know. Um, Romero of, uh, you know, Brazil. Brazil. Um, I refereed him at the Olympic Games semi final in West Germany under the in Seoul. Um, <laughs> I mean, Brazil, when you referee Brazil, it was music. You know, the, the, the old atmosphere. The vibes, yeah. The, the surroundings, yeah. the carnival. Just, uh, just, just fun and, you know, just the skill set, the natural skill set. <laughs> I, 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 I used to say, somebody said to me, what's it like refereeing Brazil? And I, and I used to say, I think the goalkeeper has got as much skill as the average English player. The time. That's probably yeah. true now in this day and age as well, with Edison and Allison for yeah, Brazil at I mean, the moment. It, 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 you know, and then somebody said to me, "Well, you know, I, I was fortunate because I, I later on refereed them in Guadalajara in Mexico. Uh, they were they, they were playing uh, Argentina, I think it was, and um, and they were the same. They, they were, uh, they, you know." The one thing that Brazil do is they take a team at, at a young age, 17, 18, they go to the World Youth Championships, they go to the Olympic Games, they, you know, then, then the, the, the Olympic Games and then the World Cup. And it's the same team developing through the, the process. And it's almost, uh, you know, we coaches talk about 10,000 times and the, the, the body mechanics uh, operate naturally. What, what I think Brazil do is they say, right, he's 10,000 times as a team. You know, I mean, I've, one of the players I admire now is De Bruyne. Yeah. You know, the, you know the, the ability to pass the ball is, is remarkable. You know, vision, speed and pace and all that goes with it. So I'm not answering your question because there are that many players, you know. Um, I look through... And, and, you know, um, you know, this is you are the ref. Uh, yeah. I, I write books. That's Platini. That doesn't look like Platini now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Platini is heyday. Uh, times, he did. Uh, we all get older. And, uh, and you know, I think that, uh, I, I, you know, I never refereed this guy, but I did meet him. I was going to ask you about Pele. We can't, we couldn't ignore Brazil without talking about Pele, but if... It didn't happen, but that would have been amazing to Pele, Maradona, and Platini. In yeah, I mean, the, well, the, the, you know, I mean, if you look at West Germany in '88 and the players that they had then, you know, they had Luta Mateus was a was a just a almost no, not like Dalglish, but an inside forward with great craft. Yeah, you know, and then of course um, I went. I did a soccer camp in Vancouver. 
years ago with Gordon Banks. Oh, wow. In the same city. So, you know, uh, and, and Paul Stirrup, who played Scotland International. And, you know, you, you work with them all week, so you get to understand them and, and you get to know them. And we all finished up going to a local cinema. On, we had a, an afternoon off and we went to a local cinema to watch The Untouchables. And there we were, crunching on the popcorn and grabbing the ice cream and drinking the orange juice and all that went with it, just enjoying uh, moments of relaxation. So, yeah, lucky to be in that. And then Emily News, I mean, uh, you know, the England captain. With, with Emlyn, my very first game at uh, Anfield, and uh, I, I, I cautioned him, the yellow card, I cautioned him uh, within 10 minutes. I gave him a free kick, and he knew I was the young boy. I was green behind the ears. He knew it. So he's on my case. He's absolutely having a go, and I'm trying to calm him down. He's not responding. And I said, listen, if you don't, shut up. I'm really going to have nothing other than to caution you. And uh, he goes, no, 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 you know, and I've gone, right, okay, what's your name? He goes, well, what's your name? Right. He goes, I'm, I'm the captain of the team. I'm the England captain. You know, I, 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 I sit every week on Question of Sport. Which world do you live in? And I, and I go, well, I don't watch television. I haven't got time for TV. I said, uh, what's your name? And I go, oh, England captain. Emling. H-E-M-L-I. And he goes, what? H-E-M-L-I-N-G. Emling. He goes, it's Emling. E-M-L-Y-N. Emling Hughes. And I go, that's all I wanted, your name. I've got it. <laughs> and, you know, and then afterwards, we became quite quite good friends. Uh, he came, he was Robin manager, played locally in grassroots football. Yep. People find that hard to believe, but he did. He played for a pub team in Sheffield when he finished at Liverpool. And, uh, and I refereed lots of testimonial games, friendly games uh, in Sheffield, and he played. And so... He would always remark, because you know, you'd go in and there'd be former Sheffield Wednesday players and, and all the like, and they'd go, Emily. <laughs> and everybody had low, not knowing the in joke, but uh, it was there. Uh, that must have been hilarious, just having banter with, with the captain like that. And it, it was like, it'd literally be like if the, if a new referee was to do that to what Harry Kane at the moment, the equivalent of today's day and age as well. But if Harry Kane can actually do something for England, that would be brilliant. But um, I'm just going to ask Salim and Safian. Safian, if you have any questions for Mr. Hackett, if you want to go ahead. I've got loads, but I just wanted to get you lot involved before I like do more quick five questions. So, Safian, you go first if you have any questions. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, obviously, you've you've uh, got a lot of um, experience over the years. Um, the transition from just refereeing to now having VAR, um, and VAR obviously being very controversial in what it does, um, has that, what what kind of effect has that had on the referees? Because me personally, I think it it's, like you mentioned before, in terms of reputation, when a referee's trying to build the reputation in, in, in games, and then the VAR says something other than what the referee said, um, what, what, what effect does this have on the game, the players, and the referees itself? Yeah, I think it's a brilliant question and probably we could discuss it for three hours and more. <laughs> um, let, let, me, let me start off at a base, and that is, you've got to understand the Premier League, there are a minimum of 22 cameras, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, a referee's decision-making process is to, to, is to be able to see. And often they don't see because a player blocks the view or they're not quick enough uh, and, and like John Moss, they're, out, they're off, off the planet in terms of positioning and, uh, and therefore they miss the challenges, they miss the decisions and they get it wrong. Now, um, so I can remember when I joined, I, you know, I became the boss of the PGMOL. I said, right, 
I'm going to bring any form of technology in to help the referee. And the first thing I did was introduce communication kit. The ability to be able to speak to each other is important rather than the guy carrying a flag and, and the referee relying on seeing the flag, which is what I had to do. And I'm saying in the modern age, you can communicate comfortably. And so I brought the, I brought the kits in. Uh, I'd watched it at rugby, brought them in. Uh, we got used to them. We had, to, we had a few initial teething problems. If you, uh, it was quite amusing because if you were refereeing at Chelsea, occasionally you get in the ear. The site was listening in as well. I want a cab from Kensington High Street to Oxford Circus. <laughs> the referee would get that, which was, uh, which was a bit off-putting. So we rectified that, and the communication kit is standard. It's used now around the world, helping referees and bringing the team of match officials together much closer. But we then had the drop Sorry, board. Sorry to interrupt. Was that literally yeah. the first... Um, were you literally like the first country to do that and it spread worldwide because of what that's yes. incredible that's literally yeah, now I mean, a standard but it was you started from yeah. yourself and what yeah, you came yeah. with yeah I mean I, absolutely because uh, it, it, in a way it was a no brainer to me uh, mm -hmm. I'd watch rugby I'm not a rugby fan but I'd watch rugby use it and I'm saying why can't we do that and it creates a foundation what I'm saying now for the for the questions about VAR the second bit was um, I, I was I was now in the, in the director's box at Old Trafford watching uh, Manchester United Tottenham. Mark Clattenberg was the referee. There was a snapshot on goal from nearly the halfway line. The, the, the assistant referee has to be in line with the second rearmost defender. And sadly, the goalkeeper dropped the ball over the line. I could see yeah. in, the in the director's box that was over. Television was telling me it was over. Referee and linesman hadn't got a chance. They were in the position. No chance. Mm -hmm. So I then went to the Premier League, stood up with all the people sat there, summer conference, and said, and somebody asked, it was uh, Al Fayed who owned Arabs at the time and Fulham Football Club. I was asked the question, given blue sky thinking, what would I introduce into refereeing that would help them? And I said, goal line technology. So I then spent uh, 18 months working with Orkai to get the system operating, where I said, I don't want uh, human interference. I want it to be full technology. And I want it to be 99% plus accurate. And I want the communication inside seconds. And so with that criteria, we worked at it. We moved camera speeds to a point around every goal is seven cameras. And they're operating at 500 frames per second. So they're high speed. And then the other thing is the computer software takes a datum point from the back of the goal line right vertically up. Uh, because the goal posts in Premier League and Football League are not vertical, not parallel. That's why you couldn't have cameras in goals for that reason. And so that, that's the system. So now we go to VAR. And I'm thinking, I'm a supporter of VAR. They've got to get the criteria right. How are they going to operate it? And through the two years of experimentation in live games, they were able to create the criteria of when it's going to be used and how it's going to be used. And the Premier League, the leading league in the world, decided wrongly, we're not going to have it. We're going to let others do it. And so immediately... Uh, countries gain a one-year benefit. Mm. One Germany, year. Germany were one of the first ones, I Germany, think. Um, women's yeah, football Italy. as well. Italy as well. Yeah, yeah Italy. And the MLS and, and Portugal. And so they bring it in, and uh, they have a very strict criteria, and they don't take the English view. The English view is, and I'm an Englishman. Uh, we can do it better. We can do it better our way. Don't worry about it. So when they introduce it, the first thing they go is, we don't need monitors. Well, actually, what we'll do is we better put them there and have them at the side of the pitch, but let's not use them. 
And so they're trying to con the public, the PGMOL and the Premier League, they're trying to con the public. Be, be absolutely honest about it. And so we've got referees now abdicating their responsibility to the man in Stockley Park, who's a colleague. Yeah. So he's a colleague. And, uh, and he's in competition with me. You know, let's make no mistake, he's in competition. So what you've done is, I have no VAR as a referee. So let me tell you, I'm, I'm walking a tightrope. And I, I liken it to somebody walking a tightrope because, you know, I'm not a tightrope walker, but I do know that when a tightrope walker's walking on that light, on that piece of rope, and there's no safety net. He knows if he falls off, death is almost immediate. Yeah. yeah. And so the reality is, he makes certain his feet are in the right position. He makes certain his concentration is 100%. And he is totally and utterly focused on walking that tightrope. It all changes when suddenly there's a, tight, there's a, there's a safety net. His concentration can be less. He's less worried about where he puts his foot. And if he falls off, it doesn't matter. The net will catch him. This is yeah. VAR. This is VAR. So what you're creating potentially, and what I'm already seeing, is a set of lazy referees. Really? That's absolutely. Given, given, given what where they were five, six years ago without VAR and the... the, the without VAR, and then now they're literally just reliant on technology or self-reliant on their colleagues at Stockley Park. And uh, is that really how you see it? Like they've just kind of dropped well, the ball. Sorry, um, I was going to say, before you continue, I could just add a point onto that, actually. So I think, personally, I think VAR is a good idea, but yeah. I think the problem is the people running it. I think yeah. that in terms of idea, it's, you know, it's what everyone wanted, you know, sort of being able to see things that the referee misses because the thing is in a game of football like a ref's going to get 99% of things right like you know throwing this way corner this way or simple fouls goal kick yeah, all yeah, that yeah. that's the easy stuff yeah. but I'd say the problem is that the, the people at Stockley Park I, I think I think you've mentioned this as well but I think it should be a separate entity altogether like yeah. just sort of not I, 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 not our sort of batch of refs that's absolutely. what I think yeah well I mean first of all the first thing is that uh, the, the, the Stockley Park, if you like, VAR should be like my assistant referee. My assistant referee tells me it's uh, there's a foul or it's offside, and I have the ability to accept it or or deny it. I, I like I'm not interested. I'm I'm the referee. I'm making the decisions. And so the first thing is that as a referee, it's important that the referee is in control. He's the guy getting paid, put it bluntly, to make the big decisions, right? And you should get them right. So the first thing is, if somebody says, in my ear, I don't think that's a penalty kick, or that is a penalty kick, or that player should be sent off, then what I'm suggesting is, I'm going to make that decision. And the only way I can make it is by reviewing it, by looking at the monitor. So all I want the VAR to do is to say, as the criteria lays down, you've made a clear and obvious error, right? Don't start to re-referee incidents that are subjective. If I'm a referee and I think that, you know, I've made that call and, I, and I've got it right and somebody's telling me it's wrong, I'm going to have a look at the screen. And if I think... I still think I'm going to stay with my decision. I'm going to stay with my decision. So that's the first principle. The, the first principle is VAR should only come in on clear and obvious errors. That's the criteria. That's what should operate. But we know that that's not the case because they're coming in and saying, um, you know, that's not a subjective decision. Um, you've got it wrong. You need to come in. And of course, then you've got the the referee with a safety net, and this is why I made that observation, is he doesn't even go to the monitor. He accepts that he's making stock and park right. Now, now we have a relationship problem. We might have an experience problem. Um, you know, if you look at the if you look at the Premier League and referee section and the index, it will show you that Martin Atkinson has had 24 games. 
and uh, Lee Mason has had 13 games. What does that tell you? It tells you that he's not injured, but the boss of the PGMOL thinks that Martin Atkinson is a better referee. And I would support that decision 100%. But Martin Atkinson, if he doesn't follow the process, could have Lee Mason at Stockley Park telling him you got it wrong. Or you could have the new kid on the block, first season, saying to Martin Atkinson, Mr. Atkinson, who's been a, a, you know, been a FIFA referee and all that goes with it, top referee, one of the top referees in the list, he got that one wrong. And he's going to go, I'm reluctant to do that. Mm. That's why the panel has to be an independent yeah. uh, individual, set, an independent set of adjudicators. Yes, it can be ex-referees, and yes, it can be ex-managers or players. And let, let's stick away from managers. Most managers are ex-players anyway. Yeah. So that's how, it, that's how it can be formulated. Now, when we come to offside, right, I don't believe it. I don't trust what's, what I'm seeing. I, I, I think we're all being conned. And, and yeah, that's a brutal statement to make, but it's, real, it's reality right by my knowledge. And my knowledge is this. The cameras that they're using are not 500 frames per second, they're 50 frames per second. So I want you to take a slice, of, a loaf of bread, and I want you to slice it 500 times, and you flow, and somewhere there you've got a picture. You pick one of three, and you're getting a more accurate picture. If it's 50 frames, you can actually pick one of the slice near that near where the decision is, and get a different picture. Mm. And with goal line technology, you one single datum point. That's the goal line and the ball crossing. With offside you've got complexity of the law. And that is, mm. a player can be in an offside position, he's not committed an offence, unless, first of all, he's active. So not only have you got the point at which the ball is released, it's when does he touch or play the ball, or has he gained an advantage if the ball's hit the crossbar and come off the goalkeeper or whatever. So it's a much more complex process. And I, and I feel that... Um, <clears throat> If you're going to use the lines, take away the human element. Give me a system like goal line technology that is automatic, or the man at Stoffy Park can look at the lines. I don't want to look at the lines, the new judge offside, because the nonsense is if the toe is offside, I'm suggesting it's onside. Because I've seen this, I've seen the clip one frame before not one after. Because when the ball was played, it could be two clips before. So, so what we're doing is, we as a, a football family, if you like, spectators, uh, you know, I'm better informed if I'm at home watching Sky than I, if I am if I've paid 45 quid in a stadium to watch the game. Yeah, because you only see it once. You don't see the replays on the screens. Oh, no, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I watched I watched a bit of rugby this weekend and I watched an outstanding referee communicate well, manage the players well, uh, no paying injury when they when they hit somebody, they hit somebody. Uh, but the reality is that I can listen in and I can see. And what it does is it gains a great deal of credibility. Time passes very quickly. If you are seeing nothing and you are stood in the stadium, a minute is an age. A minute when you're watching the screen and watching the action is less in, in perception terms. So, yeah, seen some awful decisions. Definitely. With VAR. Yeah, I, I've been in the stadium with a VAR decision when Luis Suarez scored against Man United and we had to wait for a while as well, but... Yeah. That's a whole other story altogether. But yeah. um, we're coming to the end of our podcast, Mr. Hackett. Before we know. leave, I do have to invite you back for a part two later this year because this has been a great football in education for myself. I'm pretty sure Saf and Salim have felt exactly the same way in terms of what we've learned just from the referee inside, from who you've ref, from how long your career has gone and 
what you kind of think of this kind of day and age of refereeing as well. So on behalf of Friday Night Counter Attack, I just want to say Pleasure. thank you very much. Uh, Salim and Safian, do you have anything to say to Mr Hackett before? Uh, oh, like, yeah, I mean, we definitely need part two. I've got quite a lot more stuff to ask, to be honest, but it's just hard to put everything in in such a yeah, short time. Sure. Yeah, same. Um, I've got quite a lot of other questions that I wanted to ask, but obviously short for time. But second part definitely needs to happen because um, okay. we need, we need uh, you know, some background information in, in terms of, you know, these kind of, uh, you know, situations. So definitely we need to really just hack it back on second part. Yeah, yeah, I can't. I can't wait for that to happen. As long as you're happy with that, Mister Hackett, that'd be I'm great. Happy. I'm happy. Uh, you know, where, you know where we are now, so it's perfectly fine. Yeah. But no, uh, on behalf of everyone at Friday Night Counter Attack, thank you Pleasure. very much for coming onto the show. Best yeah. of luck with your column at the Daily Telegraph as well, and with yeah, your great. book as well. Your book has been really good, and I thought that was quite nice that you put that on on camera as well. We could put that on our YouTube channel as well and everything. But um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I write uh, interestingly. There you go. <laughs> Chinese football weekly. So, mm. uh, so yeah, for sure. Oh, that's going to be know. brilliant, and it's just something that, again, you can. There's there's an embarrassment of riches just from talking to someone who's actually been there and done that, and I felt that was quite a nice conversation yeah. that we just had. So sure. even if we even if we let you um, talk a bit more than we're used to, I I didn't mind that because yeah. I just I just enjoyed the conversation just but listening yeah. to you. So yeah. thank you very oh, much for that. Okay, great. No, it's sooner rather um, than later. So we'll that's to again. I hopefully it's in person as well. Hopefully we can set up in person. I'll enjoy it. Yeah, for sure. It would be brilliant. That you know, as well. the, ultimately, at the end of the day, we might be we might create a pathway here of, of uh, people wanting to become referees. That's mm. our aim, basically, because we've had football yeah. agents on, we've had scouts on, we've had a previous referee brilliant. on, and having yourself on can only increase the popularity of referees in, in yeah, the game. Actually. Right. Sure. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone, for your time. Have a lovely Thank evening you. and take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.